the artists go out to Bimblebox Nature Refuge and this year we had a, a, a really important Queensland poet and a, a, a wonderful novelist go out there along with visual artists. You don't know what they're going to write, what they're going to do, where their work's going to go in five, ten years' time. Art takes time. Invite artists and see if they want to come out to your special place and to document it in their special way and let that work and that conversation flow out into the world. This podcast series, Queensland Women, Inspiring Stories from Environmental Champions, gives voice to the vital environment support and ecological sustainability work undertaken by inspiring women practitioners, advocates and thought leaders in this state. We hope that it offers our audience, and particularly women listeners, energising ideas and encouraging role models which can help motivate them as they develop their own contributions toward building a genuinely sustainable future in this place. To be clear, that would be a future based upon much improved levels of human and other species health and well-being, much improved levels of social fairness and an authentic, sustainable economic prosperity which leaves no one behind. The series was produced for Hope Incorporated Australia in Toowoomba, Queensland on and adjacent to the traditional lands of the Jarawa, Guyabal, Yugara and Waka Waka peoples of the surrounding region. Hope pays respect to the past, present and emerging leaders of all First Nation Australians in this country and celebrates the unique contributions their cultures make to this place. Those contributions include Indigenous spiritual respect and care for country, the sovereignty of which was never ceded. We acclaim Indigenous stewardship of the nature of Australia, undertaken over many, many thousands of years, and the model that stewardship provides us now in this place as we survey and attempt to repair some of the environmental damage created by the often misguided development approaches of only the last 200 years or so. Hello and welcome. My name is Andrew Nicholson and I am the producer of the podcast series. The important capacity of environmental art to engage audiences powerfully with environmental challenges and potential solutions is still being researched. What is already clear, however, is that environmental art's ability to engage audiences on an emotional as well as purely cognitive level, to be able to reach their hearts as well as their heads on environmental problems, is part of that power. My guest in this podcast episode, Jill Sampson, has developed great expertise in helping harness environmental artistic power to inform and persuade audiences about the dire threats to nature posed by fossil fuel expansion. The art produced by Jill and her colleagues over the years has had the capacity to persuade those audiences in a non-threatening and inspiring manner and persuade them in ways which have helped develop a motivation to support, care for, and protect the natural world in significant numbers. Helping facilitate such important environmental protection work has formed a cornerstone of Jill Sampson's important environmental art advocacy achievements over more than 10 years. Her extended efforts in developing the groundbreaking and influential Bimblebox art and Bimblebox 153 Birds project from 2012 onwards is a central focus for this interview. So, Jill, what a fantastic pleasure to talk with you today. Hi, Andrew. You too. It's it's been a a wonderful, it's a wonderful experience to talk with you as always. Thank you. And let's begin at the beginning, as they say. Let's start the conversation, as always, in this series by asking you, you as the specific guest in this episode, to go back in time for a bit of personal history on your environmental support interests. So the specific question is, do you remember how your passion for the environment started? Look, I've got to say I don't remember because it's always been there. It was there right from the beginning. Um, and it's it, I believe it was there from my daughter right at the beginning and for my mother. So three generations of women, I think we we had that. We were born with something, some passion for the environment. I don't know how that works. But I one of my earliest memories is, As a a very young child, um, maybe two or three, is hunting for frogs and tadpoles in the local creek, in the little uh, gullies around the house where we lived at that time and in the garden. And 
Um, my mother tells me that one day I walked into the kitchen and went, oh, my froggies. And I opened up the cupboard, the kitchen cupboard doors and I got out all these old yogurt containers and I unfortunately very sadly put frogs in them. But I'm sure my mother then released them and told me that I cannot keep them in the kitchen cupboards. <laughs> but um, the environment's always been, as you, as you re people will realise, important to my family as well. Um, Unusually in that we're a farming family and most of my childhood was spent in a very conservative farming area. And so we were really were out of step with many people around us, but um, my mother cared for wildlife and there were lots of conversations about how best to farm but also keep uh, environment for the wildlife. With other guests and in other series, in addition to this one, it's a, a consistent theme comes out and it's and it's not surprising but i think it has been backed up by solid social science research over the years that the earlier that a child or a young person is introduced to the natural world the more likely it is that they will form long-term environmentally protective attitudes values um principles and so that you know you you sort of fit into that mold um you know you think of books like you know richard louv's last child in the woods the sad thing is, you know, amongst many other aspects uh, on the negative side of our modern lifestyles, you know, children seem to be uh, have less opportunities than they did in the past Absolutely. to be exposed to nature. And so it's vital that we, we maintain and find new ways to get them exposed um, if we want that those future generations to be there and caring for the natural world. I think I, I made a decision when my children went in primary school to move back to the farm for a period of time. Um, and just so that they could experience that environment. On the downside, though, I think our schooling system, because of the amount of homework and assignments put into that schooling system, makes it very hard for children nowadays to spend time outside. Um, the sort of childhood that I had when I came home from school was very different to the to what my own children have experienced because of that expectation of the amount of work that um, takes them away from that experience. Yeah, that's that's so sad and regrettable again, you know, because <clears throat> even in terms of curricular environmental education, there seems to have been a downward trend. I mean, back in the 70s, 80s, you know, environment education centres, uh, the environment was, at least in some school systems in, in Australia and elsewhere internationally, was more uh, high profile, was embedded more into the curriculum. It seems to have been pushed out, as you imply, by the busy subject laden curriculum but subject laden to what extent you know to what ultimate end you know in terms of what is teaching kids but i mean that's another debate in terms Absolutely. of pedagogy and stuff like that so coming back to yourself jill and staying with earlier times you know the dear old past you know present future sort of um <laughs> structure of the interview when talking about early formative experiences you, you just had there in terms of your the influence of the natural world on you um but in a work role professional calling later down the track people often refer to other people or you know events but certainly people who influenced or mentored them in some way that was highly significant to them that shaped their views or their orientation or whatever so the question in here is is there anyone in particular you remember who inspired or mentored you in your early work during my high school years um early high school years the Franklin River campaign was was happening. That was very much in the news and um, probably an exciting time because I guess as a young teenager, I could feel we could feel this change happening um, in in government as as happened when the Hawke government swept in and stopped that Franklin River dam. But obviously, Bob Brown was very prominent, very young and prominent at the time, and hear him speak. So I guess. He was an early influence, and it, it's something that I've looked looked back on when I began the Bimmerbox Art Project was how how the art the art imagery of that river bend that photograph helped change the tide across the world. So I could see that role of art within that. Um, Judith Wright, of course, is a major influence, but I probably only really got to know about that in my adult life. Um, and her incredible work um, at, with other people on saving environment in Queensland um, and also for uh, Indigenous rights, uh, First Nations people's human rights. 
Um, and the other person that um, certainly I knew about in my childhood was um, John Sinclair, who my parents had known through the um, Junior Farmers Organisation and had kept in touch with in some capacity during his campaign, incredibly long-running campaign to stop sand mining on Fraser Island, now called Gari, and also logging later on. So, or logging and, yeah, but those, those issues and to, to bring it to protection through, you know, national park status. And um, we did a FIDO tour, Fraser Island Defenders Organisation tour when I was a, a young teen over an Easter period. And we didn't go away very much. Most people on farms in those days <laughs> didn't go away much. So that was a, a extraordinary experience to to be there and and see it. I don't remember much about what you know what was talked about, but I'm I know I was absorbing, absorbing absorbing that experience. But I also knew the incredible cost to his work personally took from him. Um, and I think growing up when I did in Queensland under the Bjelke Peterson regime, I think I've always been aware of that cost through John Sinclair's experience and seeing what had happened to different people. So there's that positive of, of, of knowing that, that people can make a difference and, and did and do, um, but also that um, concern about how you how you bring people to the to care for the environment. And I also would mention that my parents have always been a long influence on that environmental side, being growing up understanding so much from what they would talk about and what they were doing. Um, and not in a, a large way, but uh, in a small, many, many small ways and observing the environment. So they, they would be the people that I would um, select as influencers. Well, Jill, in terms of influences, uh, what a pedigree. I mean, you're, you're rubbing shoulders in effect, uh, you know, metaphorically at least, with uh, the royalty of some of the earlier environmental protection figures in Australian uh, environmental work, gen um, specifically Judith Wright, the poet, um, John Sinclair, and also that theme that often, certainly in the past, and, and, I, and I argue still in the present, and to get your view on this, but often calling for environmental protection is requires bravery, you know, being prepared to stand up, speak truth to power of vested interests that have no great interest in maintaining um, the quality of the natural world if, if money's involved. That whole issue about you know, seeking out progressive reform sometimes comes at a cost, as you say. You know, it's uh, it's not everyone's cup of tea. It's not everyone's ability to do this, but we need, you know, more brave people. Uh, than ever than ever before, it seems to me. I don't know what how you feel. Absolutely, about it. I often think that I, I, I don't have a quote, can't quote the figure of number of people who visit Gary Fraser Island now more than the the island can cope with. I can imagine if that was not there, that you know the just just the number of fishermen that go there. Um, you know, the people who go there bushwalking and exploring and fishing or what have you, that would not have been possible without John Sinclair's work. And I've got to say, John Sinclair worked with a wide range of people and he also included First Nations people. Um, is it the Butchula people of Gari? And um, right from an early stage. So he really... Um, was groundbreaking, I think, in in those areas. And of course, you know, you, you look around the world, around the, look at the, all those people, and they all included First Nations, and they brought us along. They brought us a lot, lot of education. Um, I mean, those of us who weren't engaging with First Nations people or weren't engaging with those environments. I think each of those people, Judith, um, Bob, and, and John, brought uh, us with them. They, they educated us along the way. And it's good to hear that, isn't it? Because it reminds you of the fact that, you know, progress has taken place. I mean, that, you know, commonly held, well, more commonly held view in certain certain quarters anyway, now that it's absolutely essential that we have Indigenous input and representation in, in, in any form of environmentally protective work. You know, you think of cultural burning aspects, uh, work, you know, around uh, bushfires and stuff like that, but across the board in many, many other areas that Indigenous input is key to a more um, authentic and uh, effective 
uh, environmental protection sort of process. But those towering figures like Sinclair and Wright, you know, um, over the last, you know, going back 40 odd years in some cases, bringing that onto the agenda, um, you know, and all praise to them for being those pioneers. I can just mention that each of those people also had some understanding how arts and culture were important. Um, and, um, you know, obviously Judith Wright was a poet, but also the 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 work that they did, um, she did with the environmental groups, did have a creative side to it often. And her um, testimony for the the um, court case for Gari in the 70s introduced the idea that we should save a place because of the the arts culture that was part of that, not just the First Nations culture. Um, Bob Brown, of course, has has um, in, embraced the arts um, across time with his projects, and John Sinclair was the one who was working with Judith Wright and brought the arts into that early court case. So, yeah, it, it, that's an interesting factor for me, of course, and maybe there's a resonance there as well. Well, I think, again, to my mind, just off the top of my head, that, that bigger picture, it's almost pointing, again, an early sort of demonstration of pointing to this idea of holism, that interconnection of the economic, the environment and the social. I mean, the idea that in a healthy, balanced society, you, you need a balance between social capacities like the arts, uh, a healthy environment, as well as a healthy economy. You, you need a balance between those three. They need to be given, if not equal prioritisation, certainly solid consideration in terms of the, getting the balance right. So, you know, again, fantastic work. And we'll put some links, because I, I personally, don't make yourself, but I'm a fan of environmental history and history, history of ideas generally. So we'll try and dig out some links to some of that earlier pioneering environmental advocacy work of the likes of by the likes of uh, Judith Wright and John Sinclair into the show notes of this episode. So there you were getting these influences from from superb sort of pioneers uh, as we discussed but then you actually moved you got your hands on uh, busy in your own work and you started to get involved with um, projects uh, in your own capacity. So the next question on that one is how did you get involved with environmental conservation to begin with? Um, I there's an early history of my family being involved in a local environment group and then myself, but I wasn't a very active person. I was very, I was young and I wanted to see the world. Um, but, you know, I always had um, had conversations with people to try to help um, them think about the environmental side of their actions. Um, and, of course, that personal capacity to um, try to care for the environment. But um, it was really when we moved back to the farm, which I mentioned um, earlier with my children were in primary school, when I saw that the, 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 a lot of the conversations in the communities and a lot of what we were seeing was a um, resource land grab happening with coal seam gas um, and other resources, um, in, including around the area where, where I was living on our family farm. And... It was a desire to sort of try to do something. I mean, what could I do? I had young children. I had to care for them. So I wasn't prepared to go into the activist space where other people that I knew were, where they might have been going to rallies or what have you. And I started to, I thought, well, there's probably not much I can do. There's nothing I can do. But of course, the brain then says, pops up something and says, well, what about the arts? Um and it was thinking about that, and that really the catalyst for that was knowing, at, finding out at that point through a neighbour that we did have a, a a coal exploration lease at that time that included our farm and our neighbours, the people around us. So that was a little bit of a surprise, um, but because the coal price was so high at that time which is why these exploration leases were being taken up by many, many of those by overseas companies. And, but I didn't think anyone would care about our farm. So that's when I started to think about the Beamer Box Nature Refuge, which was a thousand kilometres from where I was living. A lot of people think that I must be connect, must have been connected to the place that I must have been living there, but I wasn't. I just heard about it. And it was because it included Sustainable agricultural practices. So it had agriculture. It had um, has um, sorry has agriculture. It has a, a incredibly strong environmental 
ethic being a nature refuge, so they're caring for the environment. And there were also science projects that were happening out there about sustainable land use, um, as well as um, flora and fauna uh, surveys and um, that sort of thing. So I thought, well, no one's going to care about our farm, but maybe through the Bimmerbox Nature Refuge would be a way of bringing different areas, different people together. So that's really what happened. So it was a, a new space for me. I hadn't never done an environmental art project or run an, art, an environmental project at all. So it was a, a, I had an arts background. I had actually worked to the coal mine for a period of time and I had that farming background. So I brought those backgrounds together um, to begin the idea of the Bimbox Art Project. Yeah, really interesting, Jill. Just one theme that comes out of that for me, and, and it's, you know, in line with the, the bigger picture purpose of this podcast series, which is to give um, voice to women um, specifically in terms of their work, is you as a woman's, your, your ingenuity, if I can put it that way, your innovation in finding a way of juggling the supremely important task of caring for young children with the very important task of caring for the natural world. I mean, you you found a way to do that, bringing your talents uh, into that uh, focus uh, and, and 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 got on with that. And I, I, again, I think, as we've heard with other guests in this series, uh, that I, I'm not saying that ingenuity and innovation are the sole preserve of women, but they, they, it does seem, those, those talents do seem to be, um, you know, generously distributed uh, across the female gender. And that, and uh, it's been fascinating to hear in this series how that how those things are manifested in different ways. So you just gave us a very good outline there, You're running into that, you know, uh, earlier and, and continuing sort of environmental art role that you had. Um, and I know it's, and we're going to talk about this more in, in uh, later in the interview. It's been hugely influential that work, and we will talk about it more specifically. But just to sort of, I suppose, give a preface to that, was this next question: Was there a specific moment in time when you first realised what impact your work was having in protecting or restoring the environment? There are moments. Um, they weren't very early on i think through they were well into the project um i, I guess the first moment was really uh, it, actually as i'm thinking as I'm, I'm talking the first moment i knew that it resonated was when the project actually began to work so i had no idea whether it would work i i had didn't have the network in the arts that I do now because I wasn't working in the arts because I had young children. I, I had moved away from the arts for that period of time. So it was quite a lot of work to try to find who might be interested, what artists, who, which artists might be interested, as well as work with Bimblebox Nature Refuge and Paola Cassoni and, and her supporters. But who was going to do this? Who was going to travel at least a thousand kilometers. Well, some people traveled from Townsville and Rockhampton, so they were a bit closer, but people traveled from New South Wales and Brisbane as well. So who was going to travel all this different distance to um, set up their tent on a nature refuge to go to a place that they'd never been to, to meet people they'd never met, including myself, trusting someone they'd never met, which was me. So most of the people who came for that first camp and including the the volunteers who came to cook for us and setting up and all that sort of thing. It was a huge area of trust. So I guess really the fact that it grew legs, <laughs> the project, and it actually succeeded and continued to succeed even though there were so many reasons why it shouldn't have succeeded. Um, so I guess that's an early indication that there was a reason that it was it, it, it should happen. Um, a lot of people at that time thought it was about going to be about coal seam gas because that was dominating the media everywhere. People had forgotten about coal for a period of time. People thought coal was finished. I mean, this is 2012 and people thought coal was finished. Mm, unfortunately not. So nobody nobody knew about Adani and um, the Galilee Basin, or very few did. So it was a, a huge learning curve for many people. And I think the timing was good because... We, my project entered that at a time right at the beginning before everything sort of exploded around the, the Galilee base and the knowledge of it and the activism about it. So, um, but later on, I think, um, 
hearing that other people were inspired to develop their own projects um, to protect their environment through, like, take, take, build art and make an art exhibition and, and talk about those places in... So through art, you can talk about things that you couldn't just verbally express um, because you kind of sit slightly under the radar and it's usually less inflammatory. So that's the key. That's what I was looking to do, to try to reach people that would be would turn away if they thought I was going to give a speech about the environment or I was trying to protect something. So to, to have people come and look at the work and not realise that they're actually in an environmental art exhibition and I'm talking about coal mining and preservation of places because there's this dreadful polarising in our community around things. So I hate the word activist um, in, in many ways because I think that is used to so that people switch off. I watched that happen to Tim Flannery. He went from being a really important scientist and an Australian mm. of the Year to one word, and that was activist. And then, you know, he, he also um, had to leave Australia for a period of time. So I think that was, you know, that sort of being able to reach reach people. So um, at times when I knew that I've made a difference, well, there was this great um, research project by you, Andrew, which helped because... Um, and, and and actually, a, a couple of years after your findings, I was attending university and I was in this class and uh, they were we were asked to do a project or to design a project that would have a positive, like would have a real-time environmental result through art. And I actually said when she was giving a lecture, when she was talking about, you know, does it make a difference? Does it make a difference? And I just said, yes, it does, because... Um, there's this research project around the Bibblebox Art Project that says that art can make a difference. And then I must say the other the other main area is major area is when um, I was able to represent the Bimbox Art Project in the court case to protect the Bimbox Nature Refuge, and that has become a landmark court case where the um, Land Court of Queensland judge um, recommended that. Um, that Galilee coal project was to be rejected on environmental, human rights, and climate um, grounds. So that that really is the moment when I think, yeah, I've helped. I've helped in some way. I haven't been the change maker in that, but I've helped um, through the Bimbox Art project. So yeah, there are those times, and I also have people say to me how much it's um, inspired them or influence them, so particularly other artists. Um, and I also will mention the um, the comments book that goes out with the BIM box 153 birds. It's always good to read through those and see people who have been affected by the ex that exhibition um, and what they're thinking and what they're saying. So that's always a, a good way for me to, to feel, feel like it's making some dis dis difference. So much to, I wouldn't even attempt to not, you know, summarise that section. There are so many different aspects of that, so many different themes, but I'll just take a couple out. Uh, first of all, I think you are extremely, an extremely humble person, Jill, uh, in terms of downplaying your influential role, but clearly you must be a very trustworthy and persuasive individual, uh, but also as someone who can, you know, demonstrate, showcases persistence and tenacity in developing uh, an idea such as that artistic community capacity building initiative you ran with against expectation against your own expectation at the time against the odds in a sense that almost that suspension of disbelief or doubt you pursued it and again and this is i think this is a common theme that i've heard in many of these interviews and again i'm not saying it's particularly um the preserve of women to be adventurous and push the envelope but th that's a theme that strongly comes out to get things achieved you have to sometimes work exceptionally hard, push exceptionally hard, but look what might come out of that. 
And then other issues like, you know, vested interests that will find any ability to undermine um, people who are calling out, and it goes back to that speaking truth to power, calling out negative environmental damaging effects. They'll find any way to undermine a, a person like, you know, Flannery, as you mentioned, but many other activists. That's a, a, a well-known tactic out of the playbook of vested interests um, to suggest that these people are extremist or in some other way not to be trusted. Jill, again, thank you so much for that previous section. And and you look, coming up to this next question, which I think is very closely linked, because we're going to start talking about your environmental art achievements, which are many, and your particular level of pride and satisfaction with some of them, specifically the Bimble Box Art Project, um, probably most most, for most attention because it's occupied a lot of your time over the last 10 plus years in various forms. And you started telling us about the Bimble Box Art Project. And the fact of its importance, the contribution it's made to real-world advocacy for environmental protection from fossil fuel developments, the legal opinion and support that that's garnered. And so can you tell us more about the, the Bimblebox Art Project, which surely must rank as one of the seminal art science nature projects in this country, if not internationally? So I contacted the Bimblebox Nature Refuge to see in this this umbrella of what can I do? What can I do to try to make a better world for my children? It was a huge motivation. Um, and I asked, can I bring some artists? Can I get some artists to come out here and document the place? Because at that time, the coal price was so high. And the way things looked, I thought the, the Nature Refuge would have been destroyed within 18 months of starting this project. Um, and... So this, the, the, the germ of the idea was to get people on site. And this is where I was thinking about the Franklin campaign, that documentation of a place. Now, the Bimbox Nature Refuge is beautiful in my mind, in my mind's eye, in what I've seen. But I knew that it didn't have spectacular river bend like the Franklin River did. So it's a place that it, it needed to be documented, it needed to be experienced, it needed to be seen, um, and it's also remote. But by taking artists there, it was a way of bringing some essence and imagery and idea of the Nature Refuge and why it's of value to other people, so to the, the general population in Australia. So it really started by getting artists asking artists, do you want to come out to Bimblebox? And I didn't have an art ne arts network at that time because I'd, I'd had my, I had young children. I was, I was really caring for them full time. But um, people did come on board. And that was the very first Bimblebox camp, artist camp, which have now become the Bimblebox Art Science Nature Camps. And they have continued almost every year since 2012. They've had a break through drought and COVID, but we, we're back again and those camps have continued. So that was that was the, the germ of it. But I wanted to take, I wanted that work that the artists began to develop and, and continue to develop when they left Box and went back home to become part of a touring exhibition. So that was a whole nother learning curve for me. So the Box Art Project, the, the core of it is the art camps or the art science nature camps as they now are which includes scientists and anyone who's interested in bimble box can come along and um, the exhibition so the first one was document bimble box which actually happened in launceston in tasmania and that was a single exhibition it was really a development exhibition where our developing work was um, taken into the art gallery and seen in in launceston then the Bimblebox Art Science Nature Exhibition, which was a major national touring exhibition, which toured for three, three and a half years, I think it was, uh, curated by Beth Jackson and worked on by myself throughout and other people in that in the group that um, created a touring exhibition. There's a lot of things that have to be done for a touring exhibition. And then the next, the other element of the Bimbox Art Project is the Bimblebox 153 Birds, which is an exhibition that I developed and curated, which includes artists, writers and musicians. The musicians were brought on board by the musician and, and sound artist Boyd. And um, that was because people said to me, I can't go out to Bimblebox, but I'd really like to do something. So I developed a project where people didn't have to travel to Bimblebox um, because I could 
everybody who is on that project has one bird species that's been sighted and, and seen at Bimblebox. Um, and each bird species has an artist, a writer, and a musician that's worked with each bird species. So it's a combination of, of sound, um, poetry and prose, and artwork. So they're the, 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 I guess, the four elements, but it's really the artist camps and the exhibitions. I've stopped developing exhibitions, but um, people who come out for the artist camps they go on to develop their own exhibitions in many instances or their artwork or their written work might be published or their artwork may go into uh, selected exhibitions that tour. Um, so that's, it, it's, it's, it's really those elements, but it was to, to bring something of Bimblebox beyond the boundary fence and out into our cultural landscape across Australia. It's also... The um, Bibblebox Art Project has made um, pathways into the international community because the international community have contributed to Bibblebox 153 birds. And I think, you know, that, that a digital presence and the ability to share um, digitally and through emails and online is um, on the websites has also extends the reach of the Bimbox Nature Refuge. And there was a period where... Things were fairly quiet on the coal front because the coal price dropped significantly. So there was a pause on the developments in the Galilee Basin. So that gave time, because art projects take time, that take, gave us time to develop, develop these projects or these elements of the project, these exhibitions, I've got to say. They, they take time to develop. Just amazing stuff. Uh, and we're going to put a number of links uh, with more information <clears throat> linking to these amazing projects that you've just outlined uh, because, again, I just think the more information that people can get a, a, about these seminal art, science, nature projects, the better. You, you certainly put, I think, and your colleagues, as you've just outlined there in the, across that various work, put art, science, nature, advocacy and... Um, inspiration to the public you know front and center over those years and i know your work is still going on and you're going to tell us a bit more about uh future work projects that are on the go <clears throat> even though as you said you you've wound back to some extent but i i don't really entirely believe that jill because i know that you've got other stuff lots of other stuff on the go look just coming up now to um, the next question which is the, the sort of challenges and we we have alluded to this already the sort of challenges that people in any aspect of trying to bring forth uh, progressive reform in society, um, trying to bring uh, attention to egregious uh, and serious problems and challenges that affect uh, the well-being of uh, humans and other species, there's inevitably, some, sadly it seems, pushback from vested interests. And the effect that might have on those people that are trying to bring that uh, change about, the risk uh, of loss of energy or even burnout, the need, need to look after yourself, marshal your resources, maintain motivation across groups of people, as you've talked about, your colleagues, be there as a leader, all those, all of those things. And that's a smorgasbord of challenge. But, you know, for you personally, what have been some of the challenges you faced in your environmental artwork and how have you overcome them? Enormous challenges um, for me because I'd never done anything like this before and I didn't have an established or I had a very shrunk an established art network, so it had shrunk because I wasn't as active in the arts in that period of time with um, bringing up my children. Um, and, oh, there were so many. Like, the first one, I've mentioned the first one where would people trust me? I didn't have a name in the arts. I remember talking to one artist that I that did come out to Bimblebox, uh, First Nations artist, Pamela croft Walken, Dr. Pamela croft Walken. I remember ringing her up and saying, got this thing that I'm doing, this art project that's happening. I'm no one. I'm absolutely no one in the arts community, but this is what I'm doing. Would you be interested in coming along? And um, she did. But that was like a nature of, of my conversation. I didn't pretend to be anybody. I, I was, uh, you know, I knew that um, I'd never done this before, but the level of, of people, <laughs> somehow they trusted and they came. Um then it wasn't, it's not been a financially supported um, um, enterprise. So artists have had to fund their own trip out to the Bimbox Nature Refuge, which is a substantial distance. So that means that some artists I know have, have applied for grants to go out there, but that, that takes a lot of commitment to come out and do something like that. With the um, 
touring exhibition, the first one, Bimba Walks Art, Science, Nature, we were able to, over time, secure funding to tour that um, exhibition. So that was be paying for freight and um, and development of all the things you need, like a education kit, the didactics, didactics. But that took a lot of grant writing on behalf of various people in that group that were working on it. Um, and there were... There were certainly times we didn't get through, we didn't get grants, and then right up until the end it was, yes, we've got the grant, we can do it. Um, it also needed the support of galleries to want to take this exhibition, and that's something that I've been managing with Bimbox 153 Birds. I've been managing that myself. I haven't. I've had uh, one um, grant fundraising enterprise that was successful, but I haven't um, secured other other grants for that. So there's a there's the cost involved in that that sort of exhibition is always uh, an issue um, to get it to places that are off the main main route in Australia. Um, but also, you know, the fundraising that I did do paid for the building of the crate and um, the didactics development. I had people do pro bono work. I had a, a, someone who did the, the design work on that. So, you know, there's been a huge number of people that I've had to work with and learn from over all these years. Um, so that's that's been a huge challenge. On the and, and explaining what it is and talking about what it is and also explaining that it's not just one exhibition, it's bigger than that. There are the artist camps, ongoing artist camps, and there's been other exhibitions that have spun off from it. Um, and my own personal journey, there's been a, an enormous amount of burnout. Um, I, I can pick a particular point when I started to experience burnout, and it was when a major stressful event happened um, to our family, um, to our home and, and family. So it's, it's like an, uh, the, the difficulty of continuing to do this work over across the years has been peppered with, um, periods of, of where it, it's, it's been very, um, I felt, uh, it's been hard to feel positive about it and motivate myself. So burnout is an issue, has been an issue for me. Um, and I've got to, and then I'll, I'll also mention that um, when I was gearing up to look at um, touring Bimble Box 153 Birds beyond Queensland, COVID hit and the arts was just um, shattered by the COVID. There was no support for many of the arts and arts institutions, which had already been suffering from lack of support previous to that. Um, and exhibitions, uh, galleries closed, exhibitions were put off. So it was not a time, even though I'd started the groundwork, it was not a time to start promoting or to continue promoting Bimble Box 153 Birds to other galleries um, beyond Queensland. And then I became very ill over a, a very uh, slowly, gradually became unwell um, over a period of time. And by the end of that year, 2020, I was diagnosed with multiple myeloma, which is an incurable blood cancer. And by that time, I was incredibly ill. Um, even though we were working on the Bimbox Nature Refuge calendar at the time, which was featuring the artworks from Bimbox 153 Birds exhibition, some of those artworks, was also working on my witness statement, my lay witness statement for the uh, upcoming land court case. Um, but yeah, I, I was so ill that I couldn't I couldn't walk independently. And when I did, um, I went to emergency. Didn't get a diagnosis. Was sent home, probably in part because of um, the COVID risk at the time. I think they were sending people home as soon as they could get them walking again through painkillers. That happened to me. So by the time I was diagnosed, I was so ill that I was potentially close to losing my life. So that's been, that's really what has said to me, I need to wind all this back down. And I, I even though I have continued working on the project, we've run, and I haven't attended them, but I've coordinated the lead up to two, done the call out and lead up coordination to two more art, science, nature camps at Bimwalks Nature Refuge. I hand people over, they go, they're handed over to Paula and her team who have developed all, you know, organised all the food and the catering for that and then look after people when they get out there. So 
Um, and I've also got Bimblebox 153 birds. I started to get um, phone calls from people saying, from galleries, can we have this exhibition? So it started to tour again or started to go out to galleries in 2022, I think it was. But I, my recovery from the arduous treatment and the, the incapacity that I had experienced before I began treatment for myeloma has taken a very long time and I'm not the quite I'm not where I was previous to it so this is why it's um something that I am winding down but the art camps I think art of science nature camps will continue um at Bimblebox just working out how that how that happens Thank you for that absolutely honest and brave and unsentimental account of the ups and, and for you personally, considerable personal downs of your art project journeys. Again, because of the, you know, I suppose the, 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 one of the themes of this uh, podcast series is to perhaps also pull out some of the skills and abilities that women specifically bring to achieving the work that they, they set themselves and that interesting that set of anecdotes there about the you know which seem to revolve around the humility you brought to that early project work i mean clearly you are a highly influential highly skilled project manager however you might whatever you might say in the sense of your humble uh, approach to this you've been single minded in pushing um, these projects to their um, completion uh, with collaborative support from colleagues but there's something particularly important about how you've g- garnered that support and I just have a sense personally, and it'd be interested to hear what you think about this, this concept of servant leadership, the servant leadership model of humility. Yeah, you are a leader and you have been a project leader, but there's something about the humility and about the fact that you are one amongst equals, as opposed to that I am the big, I am, you know, at the top of the hierarchy, you're down there, um, and that's the way it's going to stay. Is, is there something about that, do you think, uh, in terms of your particular personal approach? Um, I think I had an idea and I wanted to make it happen and I didn't expect to be the leader on the whole project. I actually thought in the beginning I might have a a group of people who we worked together and I was actually, uh, because I had so little experience, I think I gave my leadership away in some ways at different times, uh, thinking that others were much more qualified. But um, it was really... It was really my project, my dream, and um, I worked on it right through and learned enormous a lot about, I guess, how to make decisions, how to how to lead, and even and and even how to and and I've got to say I didn't do leading very well. There were there were lots of times when I didn't. Um, So I really learned on the job, and I think I can see the skills that I've garnered, that I've gained, even just in writing. Um, succinctly and trying to get the right information there at the forefront if you're writing emails or anything about um, art or the project. So those sorts, there's just so many skills. Um, And I don't know that I've ever really, I mean, it's probably really only the last few years that I've felt like, um, yeah, I did, I did do that. so it is a complicated area. I think maybe I was um, brought up in a way where we we were, I mean, we were humble. We didn't have much. We didn't have much say really in the world that was happening around us. But we tried tried to have a say, I guess, or at least some we did in some ways. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a complex one, and and it's it's a. It's very hard for me inside of it to to say, um, but I, I think that I know that I'm a lifelong learner. I, I love to learn, so I pick up skills. I learn from people. I have been, I think, a fairly good learner in many situations, um, but I do make a lot of mistakes, and I really try to learn from them, even if they might pain me enormously over over periods of time. Um, certainly, always, always learning. One of the things with um, myeloma, um, the treatment myeloma, there's a really high dose chemo treatment they give you if you have a stem cell transplant, as I did. I experienced a lot of loss 
after that. And that has knocked my confidence a lot as well because I couldn't remember things. I couldn't read. I mean, I could read, but I couldn't remember what I read. So it, t- it took me years. It even, it even changed my ability to process sound. So there were a lot of cognitive changes, so it was a kind of brain damage that occurred from that chemo. Not everyone experiences it to the extent that I did, um, and it's even now I can see holes in my memory. People tell me they don't notice it anymore, but I notice when I'm trying to remember things that there's holes there, those pathways are not yet rebuilt or, I, or I've lost some memories. Um, so that has, has, has freaked me a bit because I actually... I've got to say, too, that um, I spent a lot of time in the early part of my, or late part of my teens, early part of my adult life, learning how to be a good communicator and to do public speaking. A lot of that through the Rural Youth Organisation of Queensland, which was just a fabulous organisation of its time and day, which was the grew out of the Junior Farmers Organisation, which John Sinclair had been a support worker person in the Junior Farmers Organisation. So um, that that has been a, that was a tremendous uh, skill learning um, time, many many years time for me. But coming back into this role meant that that communication has been really important, and the way we communicate is, I think, it's vital. Um, but I think I've also been very lucky because I didn't think about it so much at the beginning, but. I have worked in a coal mine. I have my my husband is a mining engineer. We met when I was working in a coal mine. We have been a coal mining family. So I have some understanding of what that's all about. I grew up on a farm. I left to start work full time after year 10 when I was 15. Uh, I've always gone back. I go back I've gone back to live there for short periods or extended periods or always visited as long as I could. So it's always been important. And it's only now that we come back to to caring for the farm. So I've had that agricultural background. I have that country Queensland ability to talk country Queensland, <laughs> I think, that other language in regional and rural Queensland, um, and I also have the art background. So this project, unbeknownst to me, really was built from a background that I already had and hadn't really thought too much about. Again, amazing stuff, Jill. I I just think, again, your particular example here of a person that became a pioneer in your own right in the art, science, nature space as a self-starter, as a clean skin starting from scratch, almost against the odds, you know, juggling many roles, dealing with severe illness, it sort of leads us into the next question, which really links to what you've just been saying as well. But how, you know, what do we draw on in terms of our professional work or or our vocation? Uh, what What are the supportive aspects? What are the senses of satisfaction and accomplishment that we draw upon that actually keeps us going? Uh, despite the challenges, despite the um, stresses, despite the pressures. So in your particular case, and you've already started talking about this, but tell us more, how do you feel your professional work has been connected to your sense of maintenance of purpose, satisfaction and determination to keep doing what you do? So initially, um, I think before I started the project, I was feeling a bit, I was starting to feel that that idea, I guess that, that sort of nostalgia, that, bit of depression about what was happening to the world. So by starting the project, I invigorated myself, my sense of maybe I can make a difference. Um, but um, it was really, right at the beginning, it was really just documenting Vimblebox because I thought we were going to lose it really quickly. And I was incensed that that it could disappear and nobody know what was there. Very few of us would know what was there. So, and I'd grown up in a period of time where um, anyone from Queensland of my age and older would remember buildings would disappear overnight in Brisbane, really important buildings. Um, And I'm not going to go through and name them, but they'd just be demolished because they wanted, the government of the day wanted them to become um, a new, you know, give over to developers sort of thing. So I had that in me where I don't like places disappearing without there being some some record of them. I don't like them disappearing at all, but have some record. And I can also see, I guess when you have your own children, really see how 
the world has moved on and in a way that isn't some is good and not always good. So I could see the changes that were happening and what we were losing, and I hated the idea of losing Bimblebox and never know no, me people not really knowing what we'd just lost environmentally. So through doing that, I, I, I found energy and um, I worked a lot at night because um, and when my kids were at school, but. Um, yeah, the, co- the there is a cost there to to family because it, it was it's been a huge project and I probably over over what, egged what I needed wanted to do because I, I wanted to do so much I had so many ideas so there was a lot of creative ideas and creatively I was alive again um, and so it gave me a network it gave me a creative network but it also gave me a network of people who had the same kind of values or similar values it gave me a network to you know Bimblebox network became part of my network um, and part of my um, virtual friend group in a way because we very rarely meet, I very rarely met many of the people. There's many of the people on my projects I've never met and I will never meet. Some people have passed away and I didn't get to meet them. Um, There's people around the world that I'll probably never meet. So that's been, um, but they're part of my network and they've become friends, some of these people. So it's... um, it's that energy that came from having a network that um, wanted to make change. And I, I drew, uh, I've always dr- drawn some kind of hope from seeing the calibre of the people that are involved in, in environmental protection or in trying to make, make a difference to climate change mitigation. So people, sign, many scientists, um, and there's just an enormous amount of people out there who are incredibly intelligent that have, have got um, an amazing background in their work that are all working for this. So that gave me hope um, because it's, it is very easy to, to lose hope when you see yet another coal mine being uh, approved or huge gas wells or even the expiration leases because, you know, I know down the track there's going to be issues in 2035 around those, if not beforehand. So it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's really a, a trying to balance that hope. So I had an enormous hope in the beginning. Um, I think it's, and it's amazing to have been part of even though a small part of a court case that's been a seminal court case in this space. Again, just taking one thing from that, um, what I'm hearing there is the value of alliance, the value of collaborative engagement with others, both in terms of achieving progressive reforms, in this case, you know, climate disruption um, notifications and awareness building uh, through art, but also that you know that psychology and value of working with like-minded people generally, a community of interest that shows that your own determination to create a better world is shared by a number of others. And in the process, that generates collective hope, you know, hope that we can create a better world, but also is supportive psychologically for the individual. So I think that was a very interesting illustration of that. Mm-hmm. So Jill, I think, you know, this group effort um, theme, this collaborative effort theme and it has come out for other guests in the series as well i think it seems to be such an important part of the total strategy of the work that guests have undertaken um you know an an important feature of how they've achieved what they have achieved um i I think it would be really interesting if you could say a bit more about that because i know that you worked with a, a very valued network of colleagues to help create the work that we've been talking about and you want to acknowledge them and say something more about them there's been an enormous number of people involved in the project at various points along the way. So right at the beginning, there were um, people who volunteered to come to, well, the, the Bimbox Nature Refuge people, um, Ian Hock and his uh, son Carl and supporters, they um, built a, um, a campsite for us. Didn't ask for a campsite, but they built it in where they thought was a, quite, a particularly beautiful area of the Nature Refuge. So they built this campsite, um, remote campsite for us. Um, and then there were people who came and 
helped feed us. So uh, Maureen Cooper, who came up from Victoria, to she she created the menus, and um, she and a, a woman a, lo, a woman from Claremont called Edna came out and and cooked for us, so that we could, as artists, we could completely pursue our artwork. Um, we, you know, everyone chipped in and helped with various aspects of the camp, but um, we were so supported. It was amazing that first camp. Um, so there's there's the people that have been involved in, in at the camps, you know, catering and um, and also the setup, and and they've refined that camp over the years. Uh, Paola Cassoni, of course, who is one of the co-owners of the Nature Refuge, and then there's the artists themselves and the development of their work. I mean, the, the, they're the, they're the cornerstone of this project. All the artists who have contributed, and when I say artists, I'm also talking about the writers and musicians, so people across the arts. And um, so really, without them, of course, the project couldn't have happened. Then there's the people that were involved in developing the first exhibition, so Samara McElroy from... Um, is currently living in was living in Tasmania, still is at that time. Who said, "Oh, well, maybe we could do an exhibition in Launceston." That first exhibition. So um, Samara and I worked together on that, and artists contributed their work. And then the Bimba Box Art Science Nature, which is a major Australian touring exhibition that had um, a, a small team. Um, Stephanie Linquist from Redland Art Gallery was on that support team. But the major people was my um, Beth Jackson came on board as curator and Donna, St- Donna Davis at Museum and Galleries Queensland. Um, Donna was instrumental in, in that because that's the area she worked in, at Museum and Galleries. Well, Museum and Galleries actually in Queensland were the very first people who gave me that knowledge and support to know that it may be possible to do this. And um, and then um, myself, Donna, Beth and Stephanie, um, but particularly Donna, Beth and myself worked across that developing that exhibition and that was a huge learning curve for me learning from them and what they were doing and particular particularly Donna so you know there was a lot of mentoring and learning that happened but also an incredible amount of work um, to do to to get that able to happen um the box 153 birds Glenda Orr was a, a great um sounding board and and help with the networks to the people, the beginning of the networks, as was uh, poet Brett Dinesius, who was the one who wrote the first call out to the poets calling uh, through a, an online publication, and he likened the project to Judith Wright's own art activism projects, which was just a lovely link for me to, to see. He did that independently. We hadn't talked about that at all. Um, and it was just wonderful to see that that kind of idea of artists working for a better future, that continuing thread or links into that. Um, so, you know, there, and, and I've got to mention Boyd. Um, Alison and Boyd were artists who came to the first camp at Bimblebox. They were both artists on the Bimblebox Art Science Nature exhibition. They also contributed to document Bimblebox in Tasmania um, and Bimblebox 153 Birds. But Boyd contributed enormously to 153 Birds. He's a collaborator on that because he he um, did the call out for the musicians and he did the sound rec- mixing um, for that. The, the musicians, so in that exhibition, the musicians and the poets and writers work is a sound um, file. So when you walk into the gallery space, you can hear the poetry and the musicians' bird call interpretations played into the gallery. You can also listen to them through headphones in the gallery space. You can select them individually. Um, and then, of course, there's, there's all the people who helped with various aspects of work, which I've touched on before, like um, helped with design work and or built the the um, the, the different elements you need for a touring exhibition. So yeah, there's a there's a a lot of people, and then that, of course that spreads out to the galleries as well, and their part in this um, taking the shows, which is just always lovely to engage with the galleries around this the exhibitions. It wouldn't have happened without all those people. No matter how much I pushed and prodded and tried, it could never have happened without an enormous number of people, especially the artists, the writers, the musicians, those creative people that so often give their time 
energy and creativity for for positive change? Well, a cast of many, many hundreds, if not thousands, uh, just an amazing group effort. It must it must have been and still is so exciting to be involved in that sort of collaborative process with so many people. I mean that that itself seems it sounds to me to make it a fairly unique project starting from scratch to get that level of community artistic community engagement must have been so exciting to be involved um and i I, you just mentioned a couple of the artists there from the actual art science nature part of the overall project the exhibition the touring exhibition that went around i remember that particular artwork that Alison Cluson and Boyd produced um, or worked on Coalface and, and the actual accompanying soundtrack. And I remember seeing it performed live as the installation aspect of what it was and, and talking about the emotional impact of art, the juggernaut of coal, destructive coal development, you know, shuffling down the gallery floor uh, on the sort of symbolic um, ships uh, that that ship out the coal, I, I, it it stays with me. I mean, I still remember that as a vivid, vivid sort of uh, image in my mind. And you know, it, uh, a, a, a picture tells a thousand, you know, speaks a thousand words. That spoke a thousand different environmental themes. So all of that fantastic energy, that collaborative energy. But wait, there's more. It's not over <laughs> yet. It's not quite done yet. So, and as we move through this really inspiring interview, Jill. Let's switch focus now, you know, to the present moment in 2023 and the future beyond. So firstly, the next question, what are you working on at the moment? I know you said, you you know, you've wound down a little bit, but nonetheless, you're still doing stuff and you're still working on stuff. So what lies ahead for your environmental art advocacy work at this point in time? At at the moment, um, Beaver Box 153 Birds is heading to North Queensland. It'll be at Tablelands Gallery in March 2024. The last I've got in place for that exhibition, I've got, um, I've had uh, calls in recent weeks from a couple of other galleries and I'm not certain yet how whether they will like there's been a few cancellations over these last couple of years um regard because of building works and because of changes at the gallery and stuff like that so you know it's kind of it's it's it, it's sort of chopped and changed a bit but um i i'm really not sure i i i need to bring all these things to a close because it the the low i have a, a much less energy and ability to to use that energy, um, I, I can't work at night because I'm too tired since since the cancer. So I, I, I'm still sort of tossing up with these other galleries, how, whether we proceed or or not, or whether it will finish um, mid mid next year that exhibition because it has a lot to give. People actually really love it. They love walking into the space and they. While it's got, I think, 158 bird species represented now, there's more than, I think there's more than 170 that are on the bird list for the Bimbox Nature Refuge. So we haven't kept up with the numbers, but it's still extraordinary that people walk in and get a shock, a surprise to see how many birds there are. Um, But also, you know, at the moment, the Nature Refuge looks to be safe, although there are further court cases coming up around this, so we're not sure about what's going to happen down the track. But for the moment, the um, Environmental Authority was refused on the coal, on the, the coal mine, so for the moment, Bimmelbox is safe from, from coal. Not safe from climate change, though. Um, and so the, the other exciting thing that's happening is I have been invited to send a a couple of artworks to the United States of America, to the Delaware University for an exhibition around the environment, um, particularly the extraction, extractive environment um, of of our world, so the resource extraction in, in in our world environment. And on a personal front, my husband and I are now the transitioning to be the care caretaker of our small family farm in the South Burnett um, and it's a place where I, I absolutely love being and um, I'm I'm living there as much as I can. I still have family, my, my core family in Brisbane so I'm travelling back and forth but I am living more and more there and being with my parents who are in their 80s now and, and learning from my father how to, how to care for that um, 
it's really a, a farm that's really less of a farm and more for wildlife. Um, and, of course, we're entering very dry period now. We haven't had much rain in this last lot of rain. So there are no cattle or livestock on it. There's some um, old chickens that are, have finished their laying um, time, so they're just there for the, the time being, and a couple of old horses. There's no cattle on the farm because we actually don't have any food for them at this point in time because of the drying conditions going from a La Nina straight into um, with, with very little equilibrium in between into El Nino and um, El Nino itself wasn't such a problem years ago but the drying climate is creating more of an issue and I think everyone's nervous about what's coming over these next few years in reference to drying conditions, potentially long-term drought. We feel like we've just come out of a drought into some beautiful wet weather and just gone straight back into it, <laughs> into a drought. <laughs> that is quite nerve-wracking. And interesting that, you know, you, you are literally right in the front line of that, given this new role, you know, on the, on the farm there, the increasing climate volatility that is bang on in terms of the scientific predictions um, of, around climate disruption linked to uh, fossil fuel combustion and the lack of ability to rein that in seriously enough, all of the things that, you know, you were pointing to in your earlier environmental artwork uh, connected to Bimblebox. And it seems to me, Jill, that whatever you decide to do in terms of specific work-life balance, and I know that's a particular you know, uh, concern to you, get that right, to calibrate that right in terms of health and stuff like that. But the ripple effects of your prodigious environmental artwork are clearly going to continue to ripple and spread outwards, uh, bringing, you know, influence and understanding and knowledge on, on the environmental issues that you were pointing to years ago. Um, that's still in process. Fantastic to hear that. So, look, as we now um, work through towards the end of this brilliant interview, um, as with other guests, uh, we start to sort of, you know, ask guests to sort of summarise and start to bring the interview to a close. And so the next uh, question is, do you have a short take-home message which could start to help to reinforce the ideas you've talked about today for the audience as we start to orient towards the end? I have some... I, I, I'll, I'll probably bring three points into here. Um Something I feel quite strong about is um, if you've got some a place that you're looking at from an environmental perspective, um, so maybe you're going out to do surveys or it might be a place under threat, look at inviting artists out to come and document that environment. Um, don't expect, though, that those artists then will donate that work to you. Like too many organisations think, oh, artists, we can then sell their work. But let go of that idea and let the artists do their thing. Let them develop their work, which they've done off in their own time, with their own money, and the artists are famous for not being paid. Don't, um, unfortunately, but don't expect to take that work then from them. Let them do their thing. Let them build on that work. Maybe even revisit that place again. Come back and make their work and put it out into the into the world through our cultural galleries and institutions and through art exhibitions or let them write that book, write those poems, um, write their story that's based in that. So Judith Wright talked about for Fraser Island, she talked about incredibly pa incredible paintings, I think it was of Sydney Nolan, that had been based in on Fraser Island. And she also talked about Patrick White's novels based on Fraser Island. So, you know, you don't know what that art's going to become that might be made of that place. I think the model that we've got where the artists go out to Bimblebox Nature Refuge, and this year we had a, a, a really important Queensland poet and a, a, a wonderful novelist go out there along with visual artists. You don't know what they're going to write, what they're going to do, where their work's going to go in five, ten years' time. Art takes time. Invite artists and see if they want to come out to your special place and to document it in their special way and let that work and that conversation flow out into the world. 
Um, with burnout, you know, taking time out is so important. How to do that? Well, that's your, that's your decision. But for me and for other people I've spoken to, it's getting out into the natural environment, switching off from your computer and phone, getting away from that computer because there's so much time spent on computers. For me in this project, it's been really digitally based, the whole communication system, except for the making of the art itself. So get away from the computers, get away from social media as regularly as you can and get out into the environment, those places we love and that we're trying to protect. Um, I think women are everywhere in the environment space. They're in the sciences, they're in the um, regeneration space for, on, on land, they're in First Nations communities, building capacity to be back on land. They're, they're just everywhere. So I think that women are doing so many things that I have no understanding of how you set about doing, and I, and I applaud them for it. I think one of the things that I've learned through my project is, and, you know, we've touched on this, Andrew, is um, the confidence to, to know that your voice is important and it's a good voice and to hold that ownership of your project so that you are the person that is connected to it in the public eye because you've done all this work. So have that confidence to own it and to have your name on it um, and have that as part of, and I, I would say, her story, not just his story, that play on the word history. So this is, we need to add her story in his story, history, rather than history predominantly in the past being written by men and the women mostly invisible. So keep your voice in, in it, keep it out there. Some real pearls of wisdom there. What I've taken from that as a layperson listening to you as an artist is trust the artist, perhaps particularly trust the woman artist, but certainly trust artists in general, respect artists in general. As the skilled communicator and professionals they are, that the form of communication that art can bring forth is that ability to make us feel, uh, to make to bring forth emotional responses to the challenges we face, helping make, as some once someone once said, helping make the invisible more visible, the invisible challenges of, for instance, warped mindsets mm. and belief systems that lead to the destruction of the natural world and therefore ultimately ourselves if we don't watch out, making those. Uh, challenges more visible so that we can work more effectively on them to counter and overcome the challenges uh, but also that regard particularly for women's voices and women's contribution to that whole um, set of challenges and the solutions to them which is another theme of this podcast series so very nicely um, put forward there Jill and now really just building on that that previous question this final question in the uh, this interview but it's been fantastic, every single thing you've said. Do you have any final advice for our listeners, and particularly for women, who might be thinking about stepping up into an environmental support or advocacy role, be that in the arts or elsewhere? Do you have any final advice for listeners who might want to get into um, advocacy roles in those, in those areas? If you've got an idea, if you think of something that you think might work, that you really would like to do, Give it a go is probably all I could say because that's what happened with me. And, um, you know, have the reach out to the person like I reached out to Paula Cassoni of the Bimbalox Nature Refuge, someone I'd never met, uh, but I knew I'd seen her name in the media around them trying to protect the Nature Refuge. Reach out to, to that person and say, hey, you know, do you, what do you think of this idea? and um, develop a support network. So support networks are really important. I think women are doing it. I think they really are. Um, and um, there's probably, I could probably give someone advice specifically on the areas that I've, I've developed through the art project because I, I sought advice right at the beginning and I couldn't find anyone to give me any advice right at the beginning. <laughs> Um, but, yeah, there's so many people out there doing wonderful things. I mean, you just have to, yeah, switch on landline on the ABC and see what some of these women, I mean, obviously there's a lot of male-dominated stories, but some, the women are right there beside 
those men on the land doing great things um, in regenerative, regenerative agriculture, leading it, or working together. Um, women, yeah, it's just, there's still very much, I think women are put into support roles and not front and centre. Um, but that's not always the case, certainly in the arts, um, in, in galleries and museums and everywhere and in the support roles. They're the paying support roles. They are front and centre. So, yeah, women are there. They're doing it. <laughs> and I think that's all I can say. <laughs> well, you've said a lot, Jill. Uh, some lovely, assertive and energising thoughts there to wrap up a really inspiring interview. It's been a real delight to talk with you today. I know that you've given our audience some great ideas which will be able to help inform their own thinking on possible next steps towards building a genuine, ecologically sustainable and socially just future in this state of Queensland and in this country and beyond. We hope that our listeners might now start their own conversations on the value of the role that environmental art advocacy can help play in achieving that sustainable civilization and on environmental protection topics more generally with their friends, families, colleagues, within employing organizations or in their professional associations. But for now, Jill, on behalf of my podcast support organization, Householders Options to Protect the Environment, regrettably it's time to say goodbye. So I should just like to thank you so very much for our discussion today. Thank you, Andrew. It's been a, a wonderful journey through. Um thinking and remembering and looking forward as well as behind us. Thank you. You've been listening to a podcast episode in the series Queensland Women, Inspiring Stories from Environmental Champions. The series was produced for Householders' Options to Protect the Environment Incorporated as part of the Queensland Women's Week 2023 event and it aligns with the objectives of the Queensland Women's Strategy 2022-2027. Hope thanks the Queensland Department of Justice and Attorney General's Office for Women and Violence Prevention for the generous funding support which made this podcast project possible. Please consult the episode text notes for possible follow-up material on topics discussed and any relevant contact details should you wish to respond to anything you've heard. And if you enjoyed this episode, please consider promoting it across your networks and giving it a positive rating in your preferred podcast app. My name is Andrew Nicholson, producer of the series, and thank you for listening.